if you've yes. <laughs> um, I'd like to present my, my old friend Paul Fremantle, who's going to talk about security on the Internet of Things. Um, he's doing a PhD currently in this and is the CTO of w WSO2. Um, so, Paul. Thank you very much. Sorry, let me get my timer working. There we go. No, it's just failed. Never mind. I'll have to try and get it right. So, um, hi, I'm, I'm Paul, and uh, I'm, I'm a keen supporter of the concept of federated identity. So, who of you use OAuth or OAuth 2? Excellent. Great. So, that will make my life a lot easier today. So, um, what I'm going to do is firstly just talk a little bit about federated identity access management. That's going to be very quick, because a lot of you know about that. Um, and, and a little bit about OAuth 2. I'm going to talk a very briefly about MQTT, which is a protocol I've been using. It's a lightweight messaging protocol specifically designed around IoT, SCADA, that kind of devices. And then I'm going to put the two together, hopefully, with this Arduino. Um, it's, the demo has broken three times this morning already. So if it actually works, I will be very happy indeed. You can buy me a beer afterwards. And then I'll talk about lessons learned and next steps. So federation is, is important, and, and it's very important for security because the, the big problem we've had with security and the internet has been centralized security, where firstly, people have failures, and secondly, it's not in your control. And the, um, especially as the number of users on the internet has grown massively, basically, people have had to move to federated models. And that's why OAuth 2 has been so popular. Uh, I see the same challenge with IoT devices, which is that they are, there are billions of them already. They're growing very rapidly. We can't expect them to use centralized, uh, traditional user ID password type security models that just aren't going to work and aren't going to scale particularly. And federated identity access management is really important because it allows you to retain control of your password and user ID. Now, unfortunately, the way most people use this is that they give it to Facebook instead, uh, or Google, and, and they trust them. And of course, that itself is a challenge. But the, the point is that if you give it to someone who you do trust, then uh, they don't hand it out to anyone else. And, and this, is, this came about, uh, OAuth came about specifically from problems like LinkedIn saying, give me your Gmail user ID password. I'll go and grab your, your contact list, and I promise not to send any emails, not to do anything else. And, and actually, they're currently facing a lawsuit in the US saying that they did more than they said they would. So OAuth 2 basically says it's up to me to, to give a token or to authorize a token for LinkedIn to say how much uh, they can access, what, what they can do, and how long that lasts. And that's also very important. Um, and, and OAuth 2 is, is a very... It seems to be the, the most used federated protocol. It's used by GitHub, it's used by uh, LinkedIn, Gmail, Facebook, and, and many, many others. So it seems to be a, a, good, a good approach, at least, to, to start using here. And, and really, why federated in, in identity access management for IoT? Well, the, the most important thing, from my perspective, is it's your device. It ought to be your data. It ought to be under your control where you publish that data, who can access it, how they can access it. If my house is connected to the internet, maybe I want to let my, um, you know, my neighbors check on the health of it while I'm away, but only while I'm away. I don't want anybody else coming along and saying, hey, the lights haven't been on, nobody's been living there for a week, I'm going to go and burgle it. So it's very important that, that you can have control over your data, and I think that's been a big failure in, in, in IoT devices so far because a lot of people haven't really thought about it. It's been a big failure on the internet overall, and it's something that we're slowly fixing. Another reason, a very technical reason, is that tokens are a much better model for managing identity in a, in a device. So most server-to-server -server communications these days, if they're designed properly, rely on tokens because a token is a user ID password is for a person, not for a device. And another thing that, that depends on your OAuth implementation, but you can potentially manage the, the tokens and the scopes quite well. So you can 
embed that token in a device and then manage it over time. So how do tokens work? Well, the basic idea is you, you get a token and you then pass just the token to the resource server. So there's two key parties here, the IDP, the identity provider, and the resource server. The resource server is what's trying to, uh, you're trying to access resources on or, or is trying to get access to your resources. And the IDP is the authentication server in this case, or the authorization server. And so, as I said, OAuth 2 is very widely implemented. I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, there are people who, who have criticisms, particularly over the concept of the bearer token, which is basically if you have this token, you are, you have full control. So obviously the stealing of bearer tokens is an issue, and that's a very big issue in IoT devices. I'll talk about that at the end. Um, of course, there's never any certainty with, with security protocols. The only certainty is that it hasn't been broken yet. Um, there is some researchers who've done a model of it using a framework from MIT called Alloy, and they've done some formal modeling of OAuth 2. So that gives you some more security. It isn't just used with HTTP. There is a, a draft spec for using it with SASL. So basically for allowing you to log on with SASL. So it's, it's getting some traction outside of HTTP. This is a three-legged OAuth. Uh, I'm going to sort of talk through this in the demo more, um, but, but if, I'll put these slides up on the, on the web afterwards, and you, if you want more details, you can grab those. So I'm also briefly going to talk about MQTT. Who's used MQTT before? Okay, a few of you. Fewer than OAuth, that's interesting. So MQTT, in fact, probably, who's, okay, so let me ask you a different question. Who's got Facebook Messenger on their phone? Okay, so more of you have used MQTT. You just didn't know it. Um, MQTT is a, a protocol that came out of uh, IBM, uh, but not uh, out of one guy in IBM who happens not to be your typical IBMer. Um, so it's not your normal IBM standard. Uh, it's very, very lightweight, very simple, uh, and doesn't, you know, and, and just does what, what it needs to. And it was originally designed for a pipeline in Alaska. This pipeline uh, monitoring guys came to IBM and they said, well, we've got MQ series in our, in our system and we want to connect our monitoring thing, stations on the pipeline to our MQ series system so we can, we can follow the flow of the oil. And so some IBM guys said, oh, well, that's okay. We'll just put MQ series on the, on the monitoring stations. And, and they were like, well, there's a 1400 byte header with MQ series and each extra byte costs us $78,000 a day because we're going through a satellite link. This was about 15 years ago, and it was very, very expensive. So they were like, mm, no, I don't think we can do that. So basically, they designed a, a protocol with a two-byte header. And uh, the, the best thing that's happened to MQTT is it's recently really the, the, a lot of it has moved to Eclipse. So there's a number of projects in Eclipse in the M2M uh, group there around creating open source brokers. There's a uh, a C based, two C-based brokers, one called RSMB, one called Mosquito, a new one from Java is just about to be donated, uh, lots and lots of clients in different languages, and there's other clients and other things as well. It's also being standardized by Oasis. Um, some people have had bad experiences of that, but basically it's just gone through with some very minor clarifications and updates, so it's, I think, a pretty good process there. There's also a lighter weight version for Zigbee called MQTTSN. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, but that's uh, actually a very nice protocol as well. Here's a sort of flow. This is a, a full reliable flow, which basically guarantees each message gets to each subscriber exactly once, uh, which is why it's quite heavy. There's basically three qualities of service. You can say no reliability. This message may or may not get there. Uh, it will definitely get there, but it may get there more than once. That's QoS1. And this is it will get there exactly once. So that requires this sort of handshake. Now, the Arduino MQTT client can only do QoS0, so there's no reliability there. But you can bridge that into a broker and then have the broker do higher levels of reliability when distributing the data. So um, in my demo, what I'm going to do is I'm going to embed an OAuth token on here. Now, actually, with tokens, there's two different things. There's the access token, which is known as the bearer token. And there's a refresh token. The access token typically times out. And, and so you normally have to go and say, well, when it's timed out, I'm going to go 
with my refresh token back to the server, the main IDP, and get a new version of that token. Now, the problem is that's an HTTP call. Now, I don't have enough room on my Arduino for the HTTP and MQTT libraries and the actual job I want to do, which is, a, which is I've got a, a, um, a little you know, accelerometer on here, and I want to publish information from that. So I have an I2C library talking to that. So what I did was I basically said, OK, well, one, one option would basically to make an access token with a very, very long lifetime and embed that onto the thing. But that, um, firstly, is up to the OAuth provider you're providing. So that's not necessarily going to work if you want to make this generic and work with any OAuth system. So what I did was I created a new component called the refresher, which is basically transferring that HTTP thing into an MQTT flow. So I, at the start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend I've got an invalid bearer token, and I'm going to try it. It's going to fail. So then I'm going to publish onto that, onto a different topic, a refresh token and get back the token I need. Then the Arduino is going to disconnect and reconnect with a new access token. So it's a little bit faked to demonstrate this process that normally would happen you know, once a day or something, but I'm going to make sure it happens every time. And then it's going to publish that to the, to the broker. And the broker has a plugin I wrote in Python which uses, um, which basically makes a call to something called the OAuth Introspection API, which is a RESTful call into the IDP to say, what scope does this ha token have? The scope is basically the access control rule. So, and I encoded the scope as a bit of JSON, saying you can read or write to this set of t topics. So that's a, that's how I encoded the, the scoping here. So then, that the Arduino basically tries to publish a particular topic. And the server is saying, does this user have, does this, this device have the credential? And then I also have a subscriber that's going to also use the same mechanism to get its subscription and, and basically pull data from it. Is that, is that all clear? Any questions? It'll become a little bit clearer with the demo. It's not a beautiful graphic demo like the first one. I was, I was uh, very impressed by that, but also rather, rather shamed by mine, which is all a bunch of bad command line stuff. I'm using, uh, all of this is open source. Uh, this bit is just a hack. Basically, the, there's an OAuth server here, which is, which is uh, from my company, but it's open, pure Apache open source. Um, it, there is a, a sort of a pseudo standard introspection API for getting the scope from here, but we don't implement that yet. We're going to add it. So I have a, a just, that was cool. I have something that's, that's that's just transferring that. I could make the, the SOAP call into here that this offers, but I don't really like SOAP, and I didn't want to have to do SOAP for my Python, so I, I bridged that into the standard call, and that's going to be in the next release of this server. So that's a sort of hack, but apart from that. And this API here is where number one is coming in is completely standard. That's specified by the OAuth spec. Really, I think the OAuth spec should specify this one as well. Um, and for some reason, the standardization of this in the ITF has kind of stalled a bit. I don't know why. Because this is a useful API to say, give me a token now. Let me know what the lifetime of that token is, what the scope of it is, and so forth, which is what this needs. And for some reason, that's sort of seen as, as behind the scenes by the AWOTH guys. So the, uh, and I, because of the, the way this has failed so many times today, I'm going to uh, actually bypass one of the steps, but I'm going to show you. I'm just not going to complete it. So the first step would be basically when you create your device. So you need to, to talk, push that refresh token into here. So the first thing I do is I go to a, a window here, and I have a little, um, a little uh, create tokens script. And this basically just does a redirect to my IDP. So this is a redirect to the IDP saying, this is where the resource server says, I'm, I'm not, this isn't my job. I'm going to hand you over to the, to the OAuth server. So this is like when you go to Facebook and it says, do you want to give this app permission to do this? So, and, and I don't have an SSL certificate on here, so it's basically saying it's not trusted. So then it says, now you have to log in and say who you are that's giving permission to this. So I put in my credentials, and I'm going to use this one. 
actually, no, I'm going to use this one. And bingo. And then it says, uh, and then that scope should really be some meaningful statement. You know, do you want to publish, uh, do you want to allow this device to publish to your topic? Well, it should be what it's saying. Uh, I'm, I've got it in a sort of, I, I, I've got a JSON string and there was some problems with the way JSON stored because it's space delimited scopes in OAuth. So I base64 encoded my JSON. So it's not very useful, but, but it gives you the idea. So that obscure string says, gets gives p permission to, uh, to publish to this particular topic. And then I'm, I'm gonna, I'm hoping this isn't gonna break the rest of the demo. So then I get some token, refresh and bearer tokens with a lifetime. They now have to be zapped into my Arduino. Uh, I'm going to avoid that for the moment, and if it fails, then I'm going to try it again. So I'm hoping that the, the, that's why I used a different ID, because I'm hoping that I haven't overwritten the tokens and, and blown them out of the water. So I have some tokens already written in here. And then I would, and then basically, what's going to happen now is I'm going to pull up one of my many windows, which has got my broker on it. So this is my Mosquito Broker with the extra bit of code in it, and the extra bit of code signal is logging. And I've plugged in my Arduino, and it has, give me a second, let's see. No, that's not right. Let's give it a minute. Let me just try it one more time. Ah, uh, it was just somewhere else on the window. So what's happened here is that it's, basically the Arduino has connected and has tried to connect with a dummy token which is this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's my expired bearer token. And it's failed. It got back a, um, you've got the wrong credentials. So now it's reconnected uh, as with a, with a ID. And really, this should be connecting to a different broker at this point. This should be saying, I'm going to talk to my IDP and connect and, and get my, and refresh my token. I've kind of fudged it by having it on the same broker as the resource server. That's, that's actually a big security hole, but it's easily fixed. So, so then it's now, the, there's a simple script here called refresher, which basically converts from MQTT to HTTP. So that takes that token and sends it to the IDP and says, here we go, swap this refresh token for a real new access token. That republishes it back onto MQTT, where the client picks it up, disconnects, and then it now reconnects with that token. And as you can see, I'm now getting some uh, data from my, from my uh, accelerometer here. And the whole thing dies a little bit because I haven't got any caching in here. So for every single publish it's doing, it's making an HTTP call to my OAuth server. Um, and it's a, it's a cruddy Python script running in the, in the broker. And I have a feeling it's, it's not garbage collecting properly and there's some memory leak and it's not working. But because it's literally doing you know, thousands and thousands of HTTP requests against this OAuth server straight away. That's easily fixed by firstly getting someone who can actually write code to do it. And, and secondly, um, uh, putting some caching in there, which is obvious. Because when you get back that scope from the introspection server, if I just go back to my slides, when it gets this scope here, it gets a lifetime for that token. So it can then say, okay, I know that, that Paul is, that this Paul's Arduino is authorized to publish for the next 60 minutes. So now I can cache that here. So, so okay, not, not the most exciting of demos, but I think what I've demonstrated here is firstly, there are some tricky bits in using OAuth on a, such a small device. 
It's not the actual token that's easy. That's just a 30 to 40 byte character. But the refresh little flow uh, is a pain because you've got, you know, you've got whatever your COAP or MQTT protocol, and then suddenly you're meant to do an HTTP request over somewhere else. The, so by swapping it out and using the same protocol for both of those, I get around that. Um, some interesting things here. So lessons learned. Well, my MQTT and I to C code took up 97% of the memory on my doing Melanova. So I really didn't have room for the HTTP library as well. Um, in fact, I had to cut out some of the I to C code to, to actually get it all in. Um, another big issue is that it's a, a huge security flaw sending this refresh token and access token without some kind of encryption. So, and there's no TLS on, on this Arduino. So I think that's something that we need to solve is how to do encryption on these Arduinos. It's a problem for anything. If I'm sending user ID and password, that's the same. So I don't feel it's any worse with OAuth, but it's certainly a problem that needs resolving. In this scenario, I would assume that I'm going to have to have some local security uh, to solve that, or at least some kind of Wi-Fi security if I'm using a Wi-Fi network. Um, one of the challenges here is that the OAuth implementations you know, are all you know, they all follow the spec, but the spec has lots of little options. And when you're on such a small device, those little options matter. So for example, the refresh token can get changed every time it get every time you use it, it can get changed. Now, I think that's a problem in a device like this because it's there's no reliability. So it might send out a message saying, please change my refresh token, and then uh the network dies or I go through a tunnel or something and I never get the new refresh token and now the old one's dead. It's hard coded in the EEPROM here. I haven't had a chance to update it. Now how on earth do I get the new refresh token in here? So there are some challenges with different OAuth specs and, and you need the right settings on those implementations to, to suit. So I want to make sure that I have a very long lifetime on my refresh token on this device, which might not be appropriate in a mobile phone where it's easy to get the person to log in and, and reset it, but on an embedded device that's hard. Um, oh, so I just hit that. And um, so I think the other thing is that some OS implementations let you update the spec, uh, sorry, the scope for, an, for a token, but others don't. They just assume, okay, you want a different scope, you're gonna kill that token and do that login thing I showed you again. Of course, on an embedded device, that's not going to work. So for those devices, you need to be able to update the scope without changing the token. Like, so, so I've got my device, it's in my house, and then suddenly I have a software update. It needs to do something different, publish to a different topic or a different target. I need to be able to update the scope without changing the token embedded on there. And I told you this was a bit of a security flaw, uh, the way that I ha had it all going through the resource server which is my MQTT broker. Really, I should have had two brokers, but that's not a big deal. Uh, one of the other challenges is there's no, MQTT is really a pure pub sub model. So there's no well-defined way of saying, I just want to send this refresh token back to just this device. So what I did was I basically created a topic hierarchy slash clients and the client ID, and I uh, implemented a, a custom security rule in my, in my security add-on to say that only this device can, can subscribe to that topic. So only this device is going to get that data. But I, I feel that, that should at least be, a sort of, there should be some kind of standard model for that, in, maybe not in the spec itself, but you know, in the kind of you know, general way that people use MQTT. So the next steps, uh, I want to do the same thing for, for the constrained application protocol or any other IET protocols people want. Um, obviously, I need to fix my implementation. It did work, but only just. Um, and I think there's that little flow with MQTT or with COAP ought to be defined in the same way that is for HTTP. Here's how you do a refresh on a different protocol. Uh, uh, if anyone's interested in this or, or has any other ideas on, on federated uh, uh, things that should be used with IoT, please contact me. I'm, I'm interested in, in collaborating. Uh, or just contact me anyway. Thank you very much. Any questions?
We don't actually have time for questions. Maybe just one, one question. Go on. My watch says we've got two minutes. What if you replace the Arduino with Arduino Uno or some device that actually can have memory and CPU for implementing TOS or proper authentication instead of only Arduino? So, so I agree. I mean, I think that's important. And, but as far as I know, there's no TLS library for any Arduino. So I think that needs to be written. So if anyone wants to do that, please, please do that. That would be really, really useful. Um, the other option would be something like, you know, there are some... Uh, ECC, elliptic cryptography chips that are very cheap, they're like 40, 50 cents, um, which would also probably allow you to do it on a, on a really cheap device like this with an 8-bit controller. So uh, I, I think, you know, it's a balance, isn't it? Do you do it in hardware with a shield? Or, and, then, and then it's sort of overtaken by improving CPUs, but on the other hand, those 8-bit those controllers get cheaper and cheaper, and so the ability to have TLS on a really, really cheap device is also useful too. So there we go. I'm going to give you a complimentary bottle of water. All our speakers get that. No, just, just Paul. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we have a five-minute break, and then we will talk on our next.